Okay. I don't know about the little pretty part, but I can do the rest. All right. Okay. And let's get this off. All right. Let me switch these names because <laughs> mine is yours or yours is mine. There we go. Awesome. 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 Okay. I think we're live now. Let me just do a check on my phone just to make sure that we're live and we're ready to go. On my end, it does look like it, but I just want to double check on my phone and see. Let's see. Yeah. I think we're good to go. Yeah, I think we're good to go. Awesome. All right. All right. Dr. Robert Jason Walker, the infamous Dr. Robert Jason Walker. <laughs> I don't know about all of that. You don't know about all that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you so much for um, joining me today um, on this live stream. So um, the live stream basically works in such a way that some people may come on live, some people may come on the replay. I've gotten some questions for people who actually could not come to the live stream, but they want to ask those questions of you. Um, so I'll be doing some of that today. But first, let me introduce myself and then introduce my, my guest yet again. My name is Dr. Renee Volney Darko, and I am your go-to pre-med mentor, strategist, and coach. And I have for you today, Dr. Robert Jason Walker. You go by Jason Walker, correct? Yes, okay. ma'am. Uh, Dr. Walker is actually a PhD. He holds a PhD in physiology. He is a professor at the Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences, College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he also is a professor in the Biosciences Master's Program. That is a mouthful. <laughs> I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. But most importantly, at least for today, is that you sit on the admissions committee for the School of Osteopathic Medicine. And being that I work with a lot of pre-meds, um, I think it's really important to bring in people who have some expertise as far as choosing students, um, interacting with students who are interested in attending medical school. And so I think, you know, I think you can enlighten us today on many of those, um, many of those aspects that students are asking about, you know, in terms of MCAT scores and, and GPA and, and just, you know, osteopathic medicine, you know, versus kind of applying to um, an allopathic school, what are they looking for? So I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about that with you. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit of background and how how you came to be at the uh, Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences, which, by the way, is my alma mater. Uh, I, I'm from Mississippi, from Meridian, Mississippi. Uh, after I finished high school, I attended Alcorn State University. Uh, the Alcorn State University, <laughs> um, and I got a bachelor's in chemistry. From there, um, I actually wanted to go to medical school. My whole dream was to go to medical school mm -hmm. from the time I entered college. The bad thing about this is, and I think that's what fuels me now, is I didn't have the information. I didn't have the information that I needed to discern the myths away from the truth. Like, right. when do you start preparing for the MCAT? What do you need? In my mind, all I thought was, hey, I just need to get these grades, have good grades, and, and I can go on the website and apply, and that's it. Mm. But, you know, as you start progressing through your collegiate career from your freshman to your sophomore year, that's when I started hearing about those four letters, M-C-A-C, <laughs> or as we refer to the MCAT. And um, our program at Alcorn State uh, the biology pre-med program they actually started like, I guess you can say a pilot program mm. with uh, the Princeton review where uh, the, my junior year, the spring semester of my junior year, 
they took 22 of us and put us in a program and basically every Tuesday night from 5 to 9, Thursday night from 5 to 9, Saturday from 8 to 5, Sunday from 8 to 5 for a period of 12 weeks, Mm. we just did Princeton Review. Now, that sounds good, but it's not good when you have your normal coursework on top of it. Remember, I told you that I was a chemistry major. And on top of that, I was co-oping in an oil refinery as a chemist as well. So I was doing all of that at the same time. Uh, Unfortunately, by the time I got ready to take the MCAT, it was more of I'm happy to get to the MCAT so I don't have to go through this course anymore (laughs) rather than trying to knock the top off of it. I was tired. I was at the end. Uh, I didn't score the score that I needed to. Mm-hmm. So my second plan was to uh, maybe get a master's and then try it again. Uh, I went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale to mm-hmm. obtain a master's in yeah. cellular, molecular, systemic physiology. And uh, while I was there, I had my ups, I had my downs. But one thing that I learned was that medicine might have not been for me. Like, mm-hmm. I still had a passion for it, but... I noticed and other people around me noticed that I had sort of an intuition for research mm. uh, and being able to, you know, walk around the lab and think my way through projects and experimental design. So uh, I was asked uh, by my advisor who went on to the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis to apply to their doctoral program. I applied to their doctoral program, uh, was accepted. Four and a half years later, I received my Ph.D. in neuroscience. Did a postdoc at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center for uh, right at two years. And then I moved on to teaching at uh, HBCU Philander Smith. Mm. And from there, uh, I took a year off and went back into the lab to, you know, kind of see what things were and to kind of, you know, reset my confidence, my career confidence and I had an opportunity to interview at KCU. I knew about KCU uh, and some of the highlights and what they were doing and them being around for almost 100 years at that time with medicine. Right. Uh, right. I was hired, and I showed up. And then I met the <laughs> dark old at the first part of October who just stopped me and interrogated me for like 30 to 45 minutes. So <laughs> I'm good for that. <laughs> And it's been beautiful ever since. Oh, you're not the only guilty one. Your husband <laughs> is pretty guilty, too. My husband's pretty guilty with that, too. <laughs> oh, that's an awesome story. I, I actually never knew your entire story, so that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Um, so I think at some point, I definitely would want to touch upon just kind of research with you because that is definitely one of the things that students really struggle with, you know, do, should they do research? Where can they find research opportunities and things like that? And, you know, when, when they are doing research, exactly what is the purpose of it for the purpose of applying to medical school? So I think we'll touch a little bit upon that. Uh, But before we do now, you are now a part of the admissions committee at KCU, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, how did you come about how how did you get chosen? <laughs> how are you the chosen uh, one? <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's kind of it's kind of one of those things where you you know what you want to do, you know what you need to do. Mm-hmm. I know that at a smaller scale, when I was at a, a, a previous my previous institution, I was working on helping students get to grad and professional school. Okay, but the one misnomer and the one mystery has always been what happens behind those closed doors in the admissions committee. Right. What happens? You know, we don't know. And I made it uh, my business once I got hired and once I kind of felt my way around to kind of make sure I got on that committee. I literally, like, asked to be on that committee. Okay. And um, with the number of minorities, uh, underrepresented minority faculty that we have, um, I was given that opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so here we are two years later, and I still serve on that admissions committee. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot that I've tried to relay to students, and I hope that I can keep relaying to students. Right. Uh, well, about I know definitely the three. students that I've met that you've worked with at the school definitely appreciate you in the role that you play um, on the admissions committee, but in their everyday lives. You know, so I think you should definitely be commended for that. That was a compliment. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, re- really and truly, it's, it's about paying it forward. Uh, yeah. My parents, my parents and my family, uh, they always taught me the aspect of paying it forward, not paying it back. Right. Yeah, if you borrow money, yeah, you need to pay it <laughs> back. back. Like that. But uh, nice deeds and just doing things out the kindness of your heart. Yeah. Uh, somebody does that for you, you need to pay it forward. I, I've been blessed to have a number of mentors throughout my uh, academic career, throughout my collegiate life, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to pay it forward. I'm What I'm trying to input into the students, I don't want them to pay me back. I want them to go out and reach right. more students as well. That's how you tra- change the system. That's how you uh, get the numbers and have more diversity in mm-hmm. uh, graduate and professional schools. Yeah. Uh, you you have to reach one, teach one. At this mm-hmm. point, not just doing one, doing five, doing ten, yeah. and continuing that without looking for anything. Uh, like I tell the students when I mentor them, I don't need anything from them. It, like, mm-hmm. like they're gonna need me before I need them. Right. So it's I, I'm I'm not winning any trophies. I'm not getting paid under the table. It's all out the goodness of my heart and trying to put them in a better position for their future so that they can be successful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you are the first admissions person that we've actually had um, that I've interviewed from a from an osteopathic school. And so, um, you know, we've had a a couple of um, allopathic school um, admissions committee folks that I've interviewed in the past. But I thought it was really important to then now go to, you know, the, the osteopathic side, especially since I am an osteopath. Um, But I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of the, I guess, the the student or the applicant body, if you will, like the applicant makeup, are you finding that your applicant pool um, has a a pretty significant number of non-traditional students? Because that's kind of what the osteopathic application process is kind of known for, right? Having more non-traditional students. Are you finding that there's a certain percentage? If you if you know the percentage, could you share that with us? Um, I don't know the percentage right offhand, but if I had to take an estimate, I would say it's roughly 40, 60, 40% non-traditional, still your uh, traditional 60%. And I'm not sure if that differs from the allopathic side. What we normally see is you normally see students go through their four to five years of mm-hmm. undergrad and then take what what they term now as a gap year. Right. They take it as a gap year and then they come into medical school or try to come into medical school. Mm-hmm. Other people might go out and get more experience. And the key thing, uh, I think it's beneficial if you go straight through college and go into medical school. But what I found is the students who actually are non traditional, they're more they're more focused. Mm-hmm. They know exactly what they want to do. Right. They went through uh, a various educational programs. Some of them might have had life experiences, jobs. And when they come into medical school, they're they're mm-hmm. super focused and they have that eye on the ball and they know exactly what they need to do. And they can actually, they, they have a little bit more resilience, right. a little bit more grit uh, than we uh, remember Angela Duckworth and what she said about grit. They have a little bit more mm-hmm. grit and resilience because they've been through a little bit more. Not mm-hmm. to neglect the students who come straight from an undergraduate right. career. I think it would be a blessing if all students were able to come, but that's not the world that we live in, mm-hmm. and that's not the life that a lot of students live. So um, I don't think it's just osteopathic. I think it's a fair share between osteopathic and allopathic of having mm-hmm. the non-traditional students. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. I mean, I think you've hit on a lot of points. Um, especially, especially the fact that um, many non-traditional students. I actually tend to work mostly with non-traditional students. That's just that's just who I happen to attract, probably because I was a non-traditional student myself. But I think you touched upon something that's really important, and that is that once they get into school, they're really like they're very, very laser focused. And I think it does have to do with their experience. I think it becomes an issue also of their academic, what I call anyway, academic maturity, right? So I talk with a lot of students and there's a, there's a critical point that they finally hit where they're like, oh, I need to, you know, I need to take my classes so I can actually learn 
what I need to know, not just to pass the class or get my GPA up. Like I actually have to show interest in this. And so they show that in many other ways too, even with their experiences. Um, now, do you find that the experiences that your non-traditional students come in with, you know, are any different or are they pretty similar to the experiences of the traditional student? They're, they're a lot different. I mean, from having vets to having uh, military vets to having nurses, mm-hmm. uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, pharmacists, lawyers, mm-hmm. teachers. We, we run the whole gambit. And to sit and talk to those students, uh, my job as a phase one director, I get a chance to also talk with a lot of the first year students. Right. And to talk with them about their experiences, uh, making a bad grade on a test is not uh, comparable to ducking gunshots in Iraq mm-hmm. or Afghanistan. True, right? Very so true. the the focus, the energy is different. Right. What you've been through is a lot different, and that actually helps our first year class. Because what about those students that come straight from an undergrad? and they're in medical school. Mm -hmm. You often see the blend of, especially when we put them in lab groups and things of that nature, you'll see an undergrad Mm -hmm. student or you'll see somebody who might be a non-traditional student take one of those students under their wing, Mm -hmm. even though they're, you know, their peers and they're both in the first year, the life experiences are a whole lot different. Yeah. And both benefit from them. Both, both parties benefit. And I think that's the uniqueness of, not just the osteopathic medical school, but mm-hmm. medical school in general, in general, because you get those different experiences that will ultimately help us as a society to uh, transform some of these healthcare disparities that we see in society today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that goes to, you know, there's, there's always the question, right, either on the secondary application or in the interview, how can your life experiences, you know, how will that help you to contribute to, you, you know, your peers in your class and things like that. And I think that that's, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, so now you talked about being a phase one person, right? A phase one reviewer. Is that right? Director. 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 Okay. So does that mean that you look at the primary application? What, what exactly does that mean? The phase one director is actually, once you get into medical school, I'm in charge of the first year okay. medical school curriculum for the Kansas City campus. I have a counterpart in Joplin gotcha. who's gotcha. in charge of the first year curriculum for the Joplin campus. And basically, when I say curriculum, that means from creating the academic calendar, mm-hmm. uh, putting the lectures in the right spot, uh, working with course directors with their courses, uh, finalizing exams, remediations, mm-hmm. attendance, counseling, uh, conversations, uh, helping people uh, go to the right school resources, whether it's the learning specialist. So it's a number of hats that I might wear. And this is outside of just teaching, mm-hmm. right? So right. this is outside of teaching. This is outside of mentoring. This is just another role that, you know, I, I happen to be promoted to at KCU that actually allows me to get more insight especially when I'm sitting in the admissions table because mm-hmm. if I've worked with uh, 262 medical students in the first year, I can tell you by the time we get to the admissions point in September, the middle part of September, right. I can tell you what we need to focus on and where our weaknesses were in our first year class. Like, okay. did we accept way too many psychology majors without thinking about their actually – their foundation in science or did okay. we accept uh, too many biology pre-med majors to the point that they're so uh, uber concentrated on science that when they have to look at the personal aspect when it comes to uh, clinical medicine or osteopathic skills, mm-hmm. that they lack those actually personable skills to actually uh, be able to relate to a patient, a standardized patient. So you real-time information, real-time knowledge that you can pass along to the admissions committee to make them, to give them a better picture right. of what's going on. Right. So you just kind of survey, you, you survey basically the territory. I see. Right. Okay. Now let's talk about the admissions 
the actual admissions process. So there was a question um, not too long ago uh, that, well, it was a statement that someone kind of posed about um, submitting applications early. And so um, the statement was such that, you know, well, you know, that bad, that the bad information of putting in your applications early is something that has, you know, been perpetuated with time. That's not how things work. Should you submit your applications early? And by early, I'm talking about between, you know, June and August. Is, is that fair to say, or is that just kind of like, eh? I don't think it's a cookie cutter answer, and mm -hmm. it's not a one size fit all answer. It depends on the applicant and their actual uh, assessment and credentials. Uh, what what are their numbers look like? You know, so do you have a high enough MCAT? And what I mean by a high enough MCAT, you know, most medical schools are not going to give you that. Oh, you have to have a 505. If you have less than a 505, we won't accept you. They, they won't have that. They'll have their mean for their class. Mm -hmm. But when you get into the mean, that means that not everybody had that number. Some right. people were below that number. And you just have to be kind of confident in what you have. Meaning, if you're confident with your MCAT score, I mean realistically confident. Right. If you're sitting with a 485, 486, you probably should hold on to your application, right. just to be honest with you. Right. Uh, regardless of your GPA. Mm -hmm. um, I tell my students that all the time. If you're sitting with a low MCAT score like that, but you have like a 3.8 GPA coming out of your bachelor's, mm -hmm. you're a prime candidate to go to a master's of biomedical science mm -hmm. program, right. you know, and give yourself a chance to uh, not only show that you can do the coursework, but also give yourself a chance to go back and redo the MCAT, right? right? But if you're one of those people who have a great MCAT or a good MCAT, you have your letters of rec, by all means. Go ahead, submit your application early. Mm -hmm. By submitting your application early, that means that you get a chance to possibly get early interviews mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting till later. And uh, once you get to the latter parts of the application stage, you have to be, it's a kind of survival of the fittest. Right. You have to be strongest or on top. Because at that point, so many seats have been taken, so many offers have been extended. Mm -hmm. So the admissions committee is really looking at mm -hmm. certain candidates. Certain candidates is not worth, you know, the time because they just don't have the metrics to uh, meet the seat needs that we have at that point in time. But if you go in early, you know, you, you have a better chance. You give yourself a better chance. Uh, I definitely would not say wait too late. I've always encouraged people to go to early, but when you go early, you have to understand you have to have everything in order because right. you give us more time as an admissions committee to go through and actually dissect your application mm -hmm. and your information as opposed to when we got everybody coming in at the middle part of the application cycle mm -hmm. when it's, we're still dissecting, but we don't have the extra time <laughs> to dissect right. because we, we're getting bombarded with a number of applicants. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it sounds like what you're saying is that if you if you are a pretty good candidate, that you should go ahead and submit pretty early. However, if there are things that are maybe a little questionable, either delay the application being submitted or just sit on it and maybe apply for another year. OK, right. So, mm -hmm. so if. And if I was someone looking at this Facebook live, the next question I would ask is, what is a good candidate? What do they look like? Exactly. So good candidate in my book looks like this. If you have a 3.5 or higher mm -hmm. in, uh, in your undergrad, then a 3.5 or higher would mean that you need to have maybe 500 or higher on your MCAT. Okay. 500 or higher, right? Mm -hmm. So... That 500 or higher, I said or higher because it depends on what type of school that you're applying to. Right. If you're applying to, let's say, Harvard or Stanford or mm -hmm. somewhere like that, okay, it's enough data out there that shows you that if you don't have over a 510, 511, then you probably are not going to get granted an interview to go to one of those schools. Right. 
Now, 510 or 511 will put you into another tier of schools mm-hmm. that are good. Medical schools throughout the United States are good just in general, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. They're, they're great in general. Say that you again. Have, Please say they're, that they're, again. They're, they're great in general. Yes. That's the reason why you have so many different cultures right. trying to come to the United States to do residencies, to try to get in medical school, and it becomes harder. Because mm-hmm. our healthcare system and the way we trained our physicians, we just, it's just zero. Like, it's not number one, it's zero. Mm-hmm. I don't think you can go to another country and find uh, a country that takes more time, effort, and is more specific about undergraduate medical education than the United States. Right. So, although you might not go to Harvard, that doesn't make you a second tier uh, physician. Right. Matter of fact, you might go to, let's say, KCU, but what happens if you get a residency in neurosurgery mm-hmm. at Harvard? Exactly. Right? So exactly. then you still you're still a set up. So it's it's other tiers to this. Your goal is to get in medical school, mm-hmm. then go through medical school, progress, and then go from there. But back to being a good candidate, three five five hundred or higher. If you don't meet those metrics, then it's a case by case situation. Mm-hmm. Is it because your GPA is too high? Or I've seen situations where you get somebody who has a 512 on the MCAT, Mm -hmm. but they have a 3.1 GPA. Now, are there, that's the part where you probably will get granted an interview and they'll come down to your personal statement Mm -hmm. and it's down to what type of interview you give and what's your story behind your 3.1. Right. Uh, Usually it's one of those stories, the cliche story is I wasn't really focused in mm-hmm. school, my first year, I didn't really get it together to the middle part of my sophomore year. And right. I boost my grades, right? We see a number of those. Mm-hmm. And those students actually do well in college. You know, they, they learn the error of their ways and then they get focused. So um, I think it's being a good candidate is using people like Dr. Darko, myself, <laughs> and looking at everybody by a case-by-case situation yeah. and saying, okay, you're a good candidate, you're not a good candidate. And I will tell you, like, if we're offline and we're meeting one-on-one, I will tell you, nope, you right. probably should not have. You save your, save your application fees. Medical school, applying to medical school is too expensive. Mm-hmm. Maybe find a master's in biomedical science program, go through, get that experience, and then come back out uh, a better student with more metrics to where the admissions committee can't tell you no. Right, right. Now, since you mentioned it, let's segue a little bit into the biomedical sciences or just the master's program in general. But we know that KCU does have a master's program. Now, are many of the are many of the students who are in the master's program are they students who are also looking to get into medical school? And what is, you know, what is the impact of that master's program? in terms of their med school application? Um, the majority, I would say about 95% of our students at KCU are trying to get into medical school mm-hmm. with a master's of biomedical science program. And again, they either fall in those two categories, either they have a, a very good MCAT, low GPA, or they have a low GPA, uh, low MCAT, mm-hmm. and they're trying their way to fight out of it. The difference here for the admissions committee is that you're showing that you can do master's level work. Right. So the curriculum in most master's in biomedical science programs are not too different from the medical school curriculum. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you can show that, okay, I can make A's in physiology, you know, mm-hmm. I can make A's in anatomy, uh, biochemistry, and then I can up my MCAT score by a couple of points. Right. That to me as an admissions committee member shows that you're actually showing the tools that uh, are the qualities that are needed to be a good medical uh, medical student. Mm-hmm. But you have to remember that uh, a lot of students don't get into medical school not because of their metrics, but because of their attitude, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You still got to go through this interview process. Right. and You fall into the trap of getting these students who have, oh, I've done this, this, that, and the other, but they give a very lackadaisical interview to the point they can't answer the questions correctly. They show no critical thinking skills, mm-hmm. although their MCAT might show us different. Their car score might be crazy high. Right. But when you get in the interview, it's like, okay, you have a 
uh, a good car score, but what about the interview? Right. You, you, you find it on the interview. So, um, to answer your question even more, you, you, you have that mixture of math and biomedical science programs mm-hmm. at KTU. Uh, I would say roughly maybe 30 to 40 percent of our students are actually able to matriculate from our master's in biomedical science program mm-hmm. to the actual medical school at KTU. Right. Now we have other 30 or 40 percent that matriculate in the medical school at other places, mm-hmm. which means they might want to go, you know, closer to home or things of that nature. So I think the biomedical science programs are doing well. Uh, over the years, we've seen more and more uh, become created for medical schools because mm-hmm. medical schools are kind of using them as their own incubator right. to kind of see, hey, this is a, rather than having an uh, 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 interview day with you, now we get nine months to see right. what you totally make before we make an investment in you. We get an elongated view of you for nine months to mm-hmm. see if you're worth the investment of a seat in our medical school. So, um we got a lot of medical schools doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So serving as kind of like feeder programs almost. Yeah. yeah. Almost. Now, those students who end up matriculating from the master's programs, what? H- how do they end up doing in medical school? The majority of them do very well. Mm-hmm. majority of them do very well because of the simple fact they are comfortable they're comfortable being, uh, as one of my old trainers used to say, in one of the military, they got comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. The master's in right. biomedical science program helped them learn to be comfortable in uncomfortable territory. Mm-hmm. Nobody who has ever went through a graduate or professional school or program would ever tell you that they were comfortable the entire time mm-hmm. they were there, they were ready the entire time they were there. They just learned that they had a routine. Mm-hmm. They stuck to their routine, and they changed and tweaked their routine in order to deal with the level of uncomfortability that they, they were going through. Like, you know, once you go to your third and fourth year in medical school, that's a little bit different from your mm-hmm. first and second. It's mm-hmm. not about the books as much as about standard, standardized patients, mm-hmm. retaining information, taking the shelf exams, and now you're trying to actually market yourself to be show these programs that you're an attractive candidate for residency. So you right. switch it. You're still trying to achieve your medical school uh, requirements, mm-hmm. but now you're actually marketing to, to try to get to the next level for residency. So you're in a very uncomfortable situation yeah. on all levels. Yeah. But our, our students do well, especially the biomedical science, because they went through that extra year and had the extra year to mature. Mm-hmm. Like I said, non-traditional students right. had the extra year to mature and they're focused, and they're more goal-oriented. And, again, in my opinion, they have that resilience, that grit that helps right. uh, show great qualities for a physician. Now, we talked a little bit about, well, a lot about, <laughs> the um, masters, you know, the masters kind of being used as the post back work. How many students are you seeing coming through who are not necessarily doing master's programs but are doing undergraduate post baccalaureate programs or doing extra post back courses and kind of what you know, what's the comparison um between those, you know, those students and those students who are doing masters programs? Um I, the comparison, the only comparison I can tell you right now is that when you go through a formalized masters uh program, then you actually with a degree. You have other students who mm-hmm. just take upon themselves to just take the extra step and say, okay, I'm going to go take some classes. Mm-hmm. Classes, post back. I'm still going to work, but I'm going to keep my mind engaged for this uh, gap year to show it will only help to add to my metrics, mm-hmm. to strengthen my application. And that's a plus because that means that you didn't take just a year off. It's hard once you take a year off from school and you left undergrad. Now you come to medical school. And medical school is maybe two to three steps up higher than undergrad, oh, but yeah. you've already taken a year off. Oh, yeah. And you're losing your foundation. And then, to be honest, the majority of the students don't have that foundation anyway because most undergraduate students uh, were trying to just pass tests, trying to get the good grades. Right. They were learning. They were memorizing. Right. So now you're forced to go back and try to play catch-up during your first year and, and 
create a firm foundation that you can build on top of. So mm -hmm. those students who go on and do the post back or go on and do the masters, we kind of put them in the same boat because yeah. that shows to the community that you really want it. You're being proactive mm -hmm. as opposed to you get a lot of students who just stay out that gap year and you ask them what did they do. Okay, I volunteer. That's great. Mm -hmm. You volunteer. Exactly. But what about your study skills? What did you learn about yourself? Right. You know, you. I don't want the first time for you to learn that your study skills in undergrad didn't work. In medical school. I don't want school. that to be the, the, in medical school. <laughs> right. That's a bad situation. I've seen it. You know, yeah. I, I witnessed it more and more, and it's like, mm, this is not a good situation. You're going to have to switch real fast and make these adjustments. Yeah. And, 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 and you can because we have the resources. Mm. We have the learning specialists who are experts at doing that. But I just don't like putting our students in that situation where you have to switch. So as an uh, admissions committee, we look at those things. Right. So – you went four years, then you took this gap year. Just saying you took a gap year is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. We want to know everything that you've done during the gap year. And the conversation will literally come down to, okay, this candidate and this candidate looks very similar. But mm -hmm. this candidate actually didn't take a gap year. They took a gap year, but they took a couple of courses. All right, they got B's in their courses. I can deal with those B's, right, as opposed to this student who just, Said, I'm going to rest on this 3.7 right. that I got in undergrad. Nine times out of ten, if you're asking me my vote, I'm going to go for the student mm -hmm. who took those extra courses because they learn much more about themselves, and that's much more re uh, that's many more repetitions for them to have been able to go through material that will likely help them in undergrad. Right. I mean, in, in so, medical, medical school. school. Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the questions I get all the time is the comparison between, you know, doing a post back and then doing the master's program. And, you know, I often tell students, right, because sometimes what happens is, especially students who have had some academic trouble in undergrad, and they're trying to figure out, well, what is the best way for me to showcase that I'm, I'm academically mature now, I can do well in school. Sometimes they think, well, I have to get a master's program because the master's is what's going to get me into medical school. And I often tell them, no, it's actually, it's actually your record. What can you show? Because if you do a master's and you, let's say you do a master's and you finish with a 2.8, but you did a bunch of post back courses and you finished with a 3.5, that master's degree <laughs> is not going to be worth as much as that 3.5 undergraduate right. course. So, you know, I'm really glad that you kind of touched upon that because I want to reiterate to the students that a master's is not absolutely necessary for you to get into medical school. However, you do have to show some academic acumen within the last, you know, few years that you've been a student to show the school that, look, I'm ready. And I think the other thing to hit on is the more time you take off of school, from school, regardless if you're working, mm -hmm. uh, the more you need to show us. Right. Right. Because after a while, after four or five years being away from school, mm -hmm. yeah, you can ace the MCAT. Great. You made a 520 on the MCAT. That's great. That's eight hours. Right. You showed us what you could do in eight hours and you studied so many months for that eight-hour exam. Right. But what happens when you return to uh, status as a mm -hmm. full-time student? I need for you to show me that you actually have those skills to actually make it through and shake some of that rust off before you get to medical school rather than you've been out of school for five years and you get in class and right. you look like a deer in headlights. Like, oh, I'm not used to this. <laughs> you know, your body's not trained. That's right. Your mind's not trained. Yeah. You don't have that focus. So, yeah. you know, it's different. So it, the more time you take out from school, the more you need to be proactive about showing how bad uh, you really want to be in medical school. You show that by going and taking those extra classes or going and obtaining uh, a master's degree. Right. Now, um, I'm going to finish out that particular portion of the, um, the non-traditional student with this particular question. And this question is about ACOM um, or COMIS basically put in their policy out last year in May of 2017 saying the repeated courses – pretty much count from, you know, from May of 2017 on. So if you take, if you take a course 
let's say you didn't do so well, you repeat that course, that grade that you didn't do so well on is still going to show up. How has that impacted the application process? You know, what, what are admissions committee people doing differently? Are they doing anything differently? Like how, how is this being filtered, if at all? I like it. I like it. It's, it's not really being filtered. What happens is we look at your whole entire application. Mm -hmm. We look at your entire transcript. I mean, your entire transcript. We look at it. We look and see, okay, you got an F in organic chemistry. You came back two years later and got an A. Mm -hmm. That counts for something. But then the question that we're going to have or the question that you probably will need to address, and we mm -hmm. give you, it's it's actually a portion on your application where you can address some of these concerns. Right. Why did you get the F in organic chemistry? Yeah. Was it because you didn't understand material or were there other things going on in your life? And, and we're just looking for a simple explanation. Right. Now, the worst thing that you can ever do. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Well, go ahead. It is not own up to it and make an excuse and put it on the professor. There you go. I tell them that all the so, time. Well, once you put it on the professor, you pretty much denied yourself admission into yep. whatever medical school you're trying to get into. It's because over. <laughs> it, it, it's over. I mean, we're all faculty members right. that sit on the admissions committee and we're like, you're going to put it on the professor? Mm -hmm. We don't have to know the professor. Right. But the professor didn't give you the F. Mm -hmm. unless everybody in the class got an F, then okay, yeah, put that down there, get a note from uh, a letter from the chancellor saying everybody in the class, you know, failed the class. We had to let the professor go, go okay, right. that's great. That's the explanation. But to put it on the professor, that's the worst mm -hmm. number. That's the number one rule. Just don't do it. Yeah. Own up to it. You know, we've had students, and that can be, you know, that shows a lot when a student will say, okay, Look, I didn't do what I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. I thought it was easy. I was out doing this. I was out doing that. That shows a lot. That shows the integrity. That shows your moral compass. That shows all of these things, the intangibles, and to what it takes for you to become a physician. Right. right? Exactly. Proving, exactly. You know, it takes for you improving the improving the well being of the community we serve mm -hmm. at KCU. I mean. The communities we serve are the communities that's all around, the communities that are sometimes in our schools, right, the right. students. We're trying to improve our students. We want them to be become better individuals, mm -hmm. become better humans, not just better physicians. It's not a lot of people that wants to put up with a physician that, don't, uh, that doesn't have personable mm -hmm. traits, right? Absolutely. If you can't relate to that physician, you, nine times out of ten, you're not going to want to go to them. Yeah. Now, you know, that's, that's just me. Or if you're if one of those people, people, you better you go in surgery, they always, they always say. say. You better go in surgery. <laughs> hey, my husband's a surgeon. <laughs> I let him know he said that. <laughs> and actually, what you meant was become a pathologist. <laughs> I'll give you that one too. Become a pathologist as well. But, you know, but, you know it, it's just one of those things that, that a lot of people don't accept it. A lot of people, right. you know, your patients don't accept it. They don't want you to be somebody they can't relate to. You know, if you're coming in there and giving someone a, a very difficult differential diagnosis, mm -hmm. they need to be able to relate to you. If they can't relate to you, that, that says a lot. So, again, that goes with the students that starts with the application process, that starts with the professionalism, that is roped around the application process, the interview process. And, you know, that, that tells a lot. A lot of people, again, get concerned with the metrics. It about the intangibles, the other qualities that make you into a great medical student, a great medical student in an outstanding position. Right. Yeah. I think that rounds that part out. Definitely. Um, I think you said that best. Now, I did want to talk a little bit about research since you have a great interest in research. And as I mentioned before, um, obviously, students are always looking, you know, to their extracurricular activities um, to obviously showcase, you know, their intellectual curiosity, um, their ability to understand complex concepts. And research is one of those ways that they can do that. But they're always wondering, well, one, how do I get research um, experience? And two, what exactly are admissions committees looking for when it comes to research 
experience? Like, are they expecting me to cure cancer? Like, what <laughs> what exactly is the admissions committee looking for? Uh, I think uh, as, I think we, as we, we move forward, forward throughout, the throughout years, the years, especially with, especially with uh, the, the, merger the merger for the residency for program, the program mm-hmm. for the ACGME, you know, between the Oscar Pathic Medical Schools and the Allopathic Medical, Medical Schools, school. research, research becomes, becomes even more priority. priority. And, and just gaining just admission, admission in the medical, medical school, school, you you need to have some sort of research I guess you could I say you role, say role or job, job in your resume, resume. meaning that meaning there are a number, number of summer research summer fellowships, fellowships that you can obtain. Uh, uh, if you go to a, go to a, a larger institution, you know, you know, there are a number, there are of, number of labs, labs that you can work in, work in off time. Off time. I think that's the I think biggest that's thing, thing is to show us that you can, you know, go through and, and actually do actually research, do research. Mm-hmm. so that you engage with, with it. A lot of people don't understand that medicine and research, and research are or directly related. related. Mm-hmm. You don't get medicine don't get without, medicine research, without right? research, right? Right, right. So yeah. in order yeah. to, yeah. to do some to of these differences in diagnosis, how do we know, how do we know about, about cancer? cancer? How do we know about migraine? A lot of that has to do with research. And as physicians become more and more research oriented, they want to publish more and more papers. If you look at JAMA from 10 years ago to JAMA now, it's a difference. It's significantly larger. How do you get the research in? Uh, research fellowships, the research opportunities? You have to look. You have to look for them. Uh, if, if you're an undergrad, undergrad and coming in August, August, probably about October, October they, start they start posting. Mm. They start posting. Late October, October early November, November, and you know, you need to be one of the first to get in on those summer research fellowships. Right. Uh, when I was in school, again, I knew that. Still trying to be a medical student, still trying to get in medical school. I did a summer research, uh, position every summer. Mm-hmm. Some after my first year, some after my sophomore year, junior year, even after I graduated, I still did another one. Uh, you can't have too much. Between your research and your volunteer hours, that shows a lot. It shows a lot. I mean, that shows, uh, you know, a lot of responsibility on your part, and it shows how interested you are in becoming a medical student. On the flip side, being a researcher and having medical students come in the lab in the summer, I will tell you a pet peeve of mine that all researchers probably will say, we don't like working with medical students. <laughs> or, or the students who come in and during the summer for 10 weeks and say, I'm going to medical school. Right, right. Because those students, you usually are the ones who won't do anything. They do the bare minimum just to show that they can put it on the application. Right. I mean, to be honest with you, when I was, in grad school, towards the end, when I got some seniority, right. I was definitely not, uh, I was yes, number one, itis. I was the no number one person, itis. like, I don't want a medical student or undergraduate student who's going to medical school, I don't want them tagging around with me. Yeah. And, and I'm just really just saying, it's all about what you put into it. If you go in there with an open heart, open mind, and go in there just to learn, mm-hmm. Not saying I want to check this box. If you go in there with a check box mentality, you might not make it through the eight or ten weeks. Mm-hmm. It, it probably will be more unbearable than anything. Right. So that's my two cents. Right. And I think it's important to understand what the research, what the research is and what the impact of the research potentially may have. I mean, I tell students all the time, you may be part of a research project that you're only in phase one of it. You know, this thing may have years to go before it is complete. However, you should understand what your role is in this particular point in time and potentially what the research is trying to accomplish overall. So, you know, I I tell them all the time, look, you're not trying to cure cancer because if you could cure cancer, you probably wouldn't need to go to medical school. (laughs) But, (laughs) you know... But it is important to kind of understand what it is that you're doing and understand what you yourself are learning from it and what you what what it has taught you about yourself. So I think that's really important. I think it's very important also that you pointed out that you have to start looking for research opportunities in October, 
November. Like you don't wait until spring semester, you know, April and, oh, well now, you know, I think I want to do summer research. Those positions are probably gone by then. Absolutely. Yeah. They're probably gone by then. And, 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 Time to piggyback on what you were saying. Uh, I've had a number of students uh, who worked in my lab, and they did whatever they needed to do for those two weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, really got after it, really showed me, okay, I deserve to be here, and did a lot of foundational data to the point that, what, four or five months down the line, my advisors had me email them, like, hey, let me give you a heads up. You're going to get this form. We're going to need to, for you to sign this form mm -hmm. because you're going to be an author on the paper wow. because yeah. of the data that you provided. So you don't know throughout the duration of eight to ten weeks. And trust me, if you're able to apply and your name is on the paper, you're that probably. speaks volumes. <laughs> that speaks volumes. To Somebody's going to want to speak to you face to face. Right, right. <laughs> Somebody's going to want to speak to you face to face yeah. because... Not every undergraduate student has a paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, just having a name on the paper, but we've had students come across who have had first author paper. Right. And, you know, uh, you know, apply. That speaks volume. That helps your application 10 times over. Yeah. Very impressive. Very impressive. Now, let me ask you a couple more questions. This question is about specifically osteopathic schools and the osteopathic letter. Now, I have a number of students who, you know, they may be in situations or in areas where they maybe don't have access to an osteopathic physician that they can shadow or something like that. What What is the importance of the osteopathic letter? Is it absolutely mandatory that they get a letter from an osteopathic physician? That depends on each osteopathic medical school, mm -hmm. but for the majority of the medical schools, osteopathic medical schools is is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't want to get into a craft if you've never seen it up close in person. Right. I mean, if you've mm -hmm. never spoken to a DO, you know, if you've never witnessed uh, manipulation, mm -hmm. osteopathic manipulation. How do you know what you're getting yourself into? Mm -hmm. And that's the argument that uh, most DOs will continue to have, mm -hmm. and that's the argument that most admissions committees will have. Yeah, we know the way society is set up, it's easy to find MDs. Right. Uh, DOs are becoming more prevalent as well mm -hmm. uh, as we move to this more organic uh, fate of dealing with the human body, mm -hmm. mind, body, and soul. Um, I, I think, think it's very important that you have a letter from a DO. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a DO around, then, you know, I've seen students go above and beyond. Mm -hmm. Maybe traveling an hour and a half, one day a week, and mm -hmm. just, just to get hands on with a DO. Uh, again, you can't invest into something that you know nothing about. Right. You know, nobody's, nobody's ever going to blindly put their money into the stock market. Right. You know, you, you, you do, want to know what you're investing. <laughs> right. You, 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 you want to know what you're investing in. So why would you invest all of the time, effort, and money to apply to an osteopathic medical school and you've never witnessed what an osteopathic medical school uh, result is, mm -hmm. the position. And to so go ahead and clear up the myth of, uh, Osteopathic physicians or DOs are not second-tier doctors. Mm -hmm. They're not second-tier doctors. I always refer to them as uh, the child that doesn't get the most attention. There's a child that doesn't get the most attention. You have a child over here that MD, the allopathic, that get a lot of attention. But you have DOs over here who deserve a lot of attention. It's no difference. The only difference is that they come, they come with a different, different set of tools. Mm -hmm. They actually yeah. have a tool in which, which they can use their hands and use manipulation. Um, and it's, it's not witchcraft. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not witchcraft. <laughs> it's actually using the body to heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it actually, actually works. works. Right. You know, I had a sprained ankle probably about seven, eight months ago before a tournament. And I just knew I wasn't going to be able to participate in the tournament. Uh, first time I got manipulation and I guarantee you, the, 
doctor, the doctor that did it. I was like, well, how long did I staff Michael? He's like, get fine. Walk on it. Different. You know? Right. It's not with prayer, uh, but it definitely doesn't receive the blessings and highlights that our allopathic brothers and sisters receive. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the last question I'll ask you, and then if there are any, there are some people who are in the, um, who are watching right now and they're commenting as we're going along. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in now. But I did want to ask you about diversity. Um, you touched a little bit upon that, and I know that that is one of your passions. It certainly is one of mine, as you know. Um, you and I kind of, you know, came together under that front of diversity. And, you know, what what is what is the admissions committee's role or what is their method for assuring that a class is diverse? What what are some things, and it, and if the class is not diverse, then what are some measures that you think would be, um, would be appropriate to to get to the point where you you have appropriate representation, um, for all groups. I think with Casey, you uh, with our mission staff, uh, we do a great job of, or the mission staff does a great job of vetting those diverse applicants and the diverse applicants actually get, you know, they don't get first choice and they're, they're, they're even, mm-hmm. but we don't have the numbers because we just don't have the numbers applying. Mm-hmm. It's hard to get uh, 30, 40% diversity if you don't have 30 or 40% in the applicant pool. Right. Just because, and just because you're a, uh, a, a member of the underrepresented minority community that does not grant you a free pass into getting an interview or getting a, uh, uh, a, a degree, mm-hmm. a degree in medicine. Right. Uh, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't at all. You still have to go through the same standards. You still have to go through the same strict vetting process. Uh, the only thing we try to do is try to widen our net and try to go to more conferences to reach those mm-hmm. members of a diverse background. Like, uh, I know our mission staff, uh, shout out to Brooke Bergman, who goes to Abercan, the annual biomedical research conference for minority students. She's been going for the last seven, eight years and it, that's 10,000 my underrepresented minority students that there. I could have been like the numbers mm-hmm. it, but it's a lot. It's a lot, yeah. And, and, and that's a way that we're able to reach more in the first background, but we really just don't have the, the numbers like I would like. Mm-hmm. And I know you and myself have talked about that a lot. Mm-hmm. And the second part of your question, what are we doing wrong or what can we do different? we got to start younger. Yeah. Like so much yeah. emphasis is put on sports mm-hmm. and other things. And underrepresented minority communities that forget that um, the only way these healthcare disparities are going to get solved is if we have people who actually come from communities that suffer from these healthcare disparities. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you don't have an underrepresented minority female physician Mm -hmm. in the room, Who's going to care about lupus? Who's going to be able to talk to you about lupus? Who's going to be able to talk to minority women about the significant increase in the number of fibroids and the younger the age of fibroids? Mm-hmm. And why you shouldn't get a hysterectomy just because you have one fibroid? Uh, the diet that is associated with fibroids or the diet that is associated with lupus or who's going to talk to you about uh, breast cancer. Who's going to talk to you about, hey, how you can go get a genetic screen just like Angelina Jolie and see if you have a mutation in that gene to kind of give you an early, you know, picture or snapshot if you need to get mammograms more often. Uh, who's going to be able to go through and ask you to maybe go back and trace your family in and be asking questions about how did this great auntie die? I know she died, but what did she really die from? Mm-hmm. We right. say the sugar. Okay, okay she, she died, died from the sugar. sugar. That's diabetes. <laughs> right. Family, right. Hypertension. Doesn't run in your family. Mm-hmm. So 
the only, only way we're going to solve some of those issues is to get more underrepresented minority participation in medicine, whether it's as pharmacists, doctors, scientists. We need them all. And in order to do that, we have to get more students involved at a young age. We had you up maybe four or five months ago to talk to six or seven grades. Yep. To me, that's the that's perfect age because they're just now starting to get that grasp of what they want to do. Yeah. And I watched as you talked to them. They were sitting there like in awe, like, wow, I can do that. Right. But you remember just like I remember. A yeah. number of had never seen a black physician. Yep. Mm-hmm. And and never seen in a black position. So we have to get out there, not only in the black community, the Hispanic community, uh, Native Americans. We have to do those things in order to change the perspective in healthcare. Um, I, I think the more numbers we get from underrepresented minority communities, you'll see a significant decrease in healthcare disparities mm-hmm. because now it's impacting you and your household. Uh, I never forget, um, and it's a little bit off. Kirk Franklin, when I was in Oklahoma City, he came to a church. Church was packed to capacity. And he had a relative who had just died from uh, a heart attack. His question was, stand up if you had a relative who has been affected by hypertension or diabetes. Mm-hmm. Not one person in the church was sitting. Hmm. And so, so 2,000 members in that church. Right. Right. That, 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 that says a lot. lot. Yeah, that says a lot. Yeah. That's my take. Right. right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think, I think that is very impactful. That sharing that story is really impactful because it does show you that minorities obviously are very disproportionately affected by the things that <laughs> probably have the most disparities um, in healthcare. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I have some comments. Let's see. All right. So Dr. Shanika, she says, good info docs. Thank you, Dr. Shanika. Uh, Belle, Belle is a student that I worked with. Uh, she actually is in a special master's program. So she says, thank you. She has um, that we, you gave some great information about the master's program. Um, Dr. Hoden, Dr. Hoden says great info. Uh, Victoria, Victoria actually is one of the students in my pre-med, uh, or in my strategic pre-meds group, and she says she's getting some good info as well. Um, Tonka, Tonka says hello, and she has a question, I think, about research. She says, the role of research is important. Um, will there be written and publishing recognition or just data entry and tracking progress? And I think you kind of answered that question when you talked about, when we talked about the role um, that you could potentially play in a research project. So I hope that answered your question, Tonka. Um, and Ray, Ray is a student that I, I work with as well. She says, please disregard if you touched on this in the beginning of the interview. She came in a little bit later. But she says, beyond addressing the feedback of admissions committees, what do reapplicants need to focus on or highlight? Which is a good question because there are going to be a number of reapplicants. And so the question becomes, if you are applying, if you apply one year and you get rejected and you apply to the same school, um, with regards to that feedback, you know, what, what, what's the next step? The first thing I would do is uh, contact your admissions staff mm-hmm. at that school and don't email. Contact them by phone. Okay. Uh, a lot of times, if you contact them by phone, there'll be more than likely to give you information on maybe why the admissions committee floated one way or the other uh, on your decision and what you need to do to strengthen your application. The worst thing that I see, and I think it's a waste of time, is you see an applicant who didn't do anything to improve the application over the span of a year. Mm-hmm. They presented the same application, just maybe with some updated letter reps. Right. It's the same metrics. Nothing has changed. And they expect a different outcome. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
what is, what is the definition of insanity, doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting a different result. Right. You, you can't expect a different result. Even if you have different community members, you won't expect a different result mm-hmm. because you'll know, okay, what we're doing is consistent. Right. What, what we're doing is consistent. And you always need to look and self-assess to re-strengthen your application. Is your MCAT score high enough? Uh, was your GPA high enough? If your GPA went high enough, did you have enough uh, shadowing out? Any research experience? You can, uh, the majority of applications can look, uh, applicants can look at their uh, self and self-assess and see whether we get an application. Right. So if you can't, then I encourage you to reach out to a company like Premier Strategy so that they can go through and look and kind of dissect your application. And I actually want to commend you, Dr. Darko, and I would encourage anybody that's listening, use companies like this. I mean, use companies like this, use people like this to vet your application before you submit it. You might say, okay, I might have to pay a price. I know for a fact Dr. Darko doesn't need the money. Right. But she's doing it because once you associate a price with something, it mm-hmm. creates a, a new type of priority and seriousness in the person who actually has to pay for it. Right. I would rather pay whatever the price is, have somebody vet my application, go through dissect, tell me what I need to do, and then have that confidence in submitting it once I fulfill everything that they ask me to do, as opposed to blindly submitting the application. Mm-hmm. And just doing it as a shot in the dark. You, you shouldn't do that. Um, I'm not on the company payroll, so I wouldn't pay. Uh, this is well, you know, Dr. Darko, if you want to send me a couple of dollars for my plug, I, I will, I will take it. But no, I mean, in all seriousness, we, we should do these things because then you won't have to worry about the reapplication process because you won't be reapplying. You'll be in medical school. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for saying that. Um, I think it's really important that you kind of touched upon that. Sometimes the investment in yourself, you know, really makes you just become a little that much more serious about what it is that you're doing. Um, And so that is that is why I do what I do. So thank you for that. Um, Victoria also says, let's see. You may have touched base with this. Um, How many shadowing hours is recommended? That's another, that's another big question. How many shadowing hours? I'm going to say it depends on the school. My, my, my number is 100. I always go for 100. I always go for 100. Yeah. Uh, more schools, you have some schools that want more. You have some schools that want less. Right. But if they want more than 100, you're not that far away from whatever they want. They're not going to ask you from for some crazy amount like 1,000. Right. But 100 is a good estimate to kind of see if you are in love with the, the actual position, the career, and what's going on that allows you to grip what's going on, uh, gain some of the quality, and if you're seeking a letter of recommendation from that person, 100 hours is a great way of having enough time around a position to where they can understand your quality and write a great letter of rec for you. Right. Now, the worst thing you can do is do five and say you shadowed. Five hours. Right. Um, you know, you have to break it down. A hundred hours, it's 168 hours in a week. If I say a hundred hours, you're giving less than a week, you know, total to something that you plan on investing 30, 40, 50 years in. So think about that. And I just that as when you get to looking at that hundred. But it's important that whenever you do those volunteering shadowing hours that you maybe create a sign off sheet. I think they have some on the internet or you can create some on your own to where at the end of a, a certain time you keep a track of the hours and you have someone sign off on it. And actually it's passing at the application that wouldn't be a bad idea either because it is uh that that for the bit for the process. That's proof. Right. And when you say 100 hours, would you say, for example, if a person shadows three physicians, would you say 100 hours each, 100 hours total? Because I know that's the next question that's coming up. I would say 100 hours total. Total. Uh, Mm -hmm. You get a nice picture, that's even better. If you shadow 100 hours in one physician, that's not bad. 
but to get a nice mixture is even better, especially to most people don't understand which specialties they're going to go into. Uh, when you ask students when they're in medical school, they give you their top three. Right. So you can find three different specialties. The shadow farm, that's even better. You know, maybe OPY, maybe cardio, uh, thoracic, maybe neurosurgery. Uh, things, primary care, family medicine, whatever. You know, if you want to shadow different specialties, that's even better because it even gives you a wide array. Uh, what, what you, you can, can look, look forward to if you decide to go in uh, a, a different specialty other than the one that you had the site set on. Right. Yeah, because you just don't know if you haven't been exposed to different ones if if this is really the one for you. So, and I'll ask one last question. The last question is from Ray again, and she asks, what advice do you have for mock interview pre- preparation? What are admissions committees looking for in the interview um, I was rejected the last cycle, and the admissions committee wasn't able to provide specific comments about the interview. And I think you and I talked about this, or at least over email at one point, and I was like, hey, what's up? <laughs> what's up with that? <laughs> so, it, it depends on your mindset. I feel that I was always taught that if you give me the interview, you just gave me the job. Right. Because I prepare, prepare for an interview. Mm-hmm. That's how I prepare. prepare. Uh, I'm prepared for any question you may ask. Mock interviews, you need to have them. But you need to have mock interviews with people who are going to fully and truthfully assess your weaknesses and your strengths. Uh, if they're not going to fully assess your weaknesses and your strengths, and they're just going to sit there for 30 minutes and say you did a great job. Great job. Out there, that's not the person that you need. You need a person that is mean. You know what I mean? I've had students, uh, particularly this year, who just got into medical school. I did mock interviews with a couple of my mentees, and uh, one of my mentees, uh, I'll keep her name to myself, but she she is scarred for life. Because I literally, <laughs> but I literally she's in school. I literally walked out of her mock interview like, this is trash. Like, straight to my time and walked out. But she's in school now. And she's in school. Uh, if you ask her, and she's stuck with her for the rest of her life. She had 18 hours to go back. And we do everything that she could possibly think of. She came back and asked me what she did wrong. And I told her. But what happened was she saved me to last. And the two other people that she had went to two weeks prior told her she did a great job. You did a great job. You did a great job. You'll get in. And no, that's not the case. You didn't show me that you could uh, answer the question. You didn't show me that you could think. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to be ready for some of these questions. Right. self assessment I ask questions that make you self assess right. You know, tell me your weaknesses. I might not say it like, okay, tell me your weaknesses, but I can get around it. Right. And, you know, the worst thing I hate to hear is, oh, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. You, you know, I really don't know. Right. I, I know saying I don't know sometimes is okay, but... In an interview, you probably want to limit that. You want to limit that to maybe one time. Exactly. One time. Uh, the other thing I would tell you is uh, 60 Seconds. There's a book called 60 Seconds to a Perfect Interview or something like that. 60 Seconds to a Perfect Interview. Mm-hmm. I would get that book if I were, if I were anybody. Right. Job, school, anything. And the reason why I would get the book is if you skip straight to Chapter 3. The author gives 150 interview questions mm-hmm. with the appropriate answer and what they're trying to look for. So what I have done, even with my job at KCU, I went through, and it took me probably about three weeks to do it. I went through all 150 questions, that, or all of the questions that were geared towards me and where I was in my career, and answered them in my own words. Right. And I didn't memorize my answers, but at least I saw the question, formulated the answer. So by the time I got to the interview, guess what? It, every question during my interview throughout the scope of eight hours, it came from one of those 150. Right. It's only so many questions that medical school interviews can ask you. Yeah. 
they're all we're all looking for the same thing. Right. We're all looking for the same thing. We all have those different boxes to check. Mm-hmm. So prepare for your mock interviews. Don't be uh, afraid of criticism. In fact, take it. Mm-hmm. And if nobody gives you any criticism, red flag. Run. Run. <laughs> yeah. Run. If, if you did a perfect interview, there's no such thing as a perfect interview. Yep. Like, there's no such thing. Uh, you, you probably need to call somebody else. And, you know, and, and if it's somebody that's geared towards something, go ask one of your, your relatives. Mm-hmm. So I, I remember, uh, I think my grandmother, when I was in high school, asked me an interview question. And that was the hardest interview question I ever had in my life. And she gave me the, the most hurtful criticism that I ever got in my life. And I was like, oh, that hurt. I feel better for it. it. Right. So go to those people. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, you hit the nail right on the head. Sometimes I will, even with a personal statement, you know, when I work with students and I read a personal statement and they'll say, yeah, you know, I had somebody read this, but I just wanted to run it by you. And, you know, they, they told me I did a great job. And I'm like, this personal statement is not going to make it. <laughs> like, this is not it. You know, <laughs> and sometimes you just have to be brutally honest because at the end of the day, you're trying to help someone and you know, you're not helping them by just making them feel good. Um, you can you can feel good all you want, but you're going to feel worse if you if you don't ac- accomplish your goal. And oh, you get a rejection letter in, right. in, the, in the mail. And, and that young lady, after she got her acceptance letter, mm-hmm. still was mad with me. But she came to my office and still was like, okay, I kind of see, but I'm still mad. I'm still mad. I'm still mad. And maybe I shouldn't have said her interview was trash. But, trash. You know, I maybe that was a little bit hard. But it got the point across. Right. She fixed it. She fixed Absolutely. it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Walker, for joining me. I think you gave such great information tonight, some actionable steps. Um, that book, 60 Seconds to Interview, is that is that the name of the book? I, I, I think, think I think it's something, something like that. Something like that. Um, okay. Something, something like, like that. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think that that will be helpful. Um, you know, you, you've touched upon a lot of things that I think the, the pre-meds that are in my group, the pre-meds that I work with, that they are asking about all the time. And so, you know, much of the, much of what you have said, I have definitely said to them, but I always want them to hear it from someone else so that they understand that this is not just my opinion. This is what it is. This is the climate of how to get into medical school. This is what medical schools are looking for. And so bringing different people on from different admissions committees, it is really nice to see that there is a lot of consistency. And I think, you know, in in surgery, apparently there's a saying in surgery in order to be a master at a certain procedure, you have to do it 50 times. And maybe that's the same thing with, you know, applying to medical school and understanding the process. Maybe you have it to, have to hear it so many times before you actually get it in your head and understand that it's not just about the metrics. It's more than that. Um, and that's why I started pre-med strategies because, you know, if it was just checking off boxes, I'd call it pre-med check boxes. But it's not. It's really about strategy. So thank you so much for for joining us. And um, make sure that you tell uh, KCU, I'll be out there soon. <laughs> I, I definitely will tell them that. And thank you for having me uh, on this great uh, Skype slash podcast. And I hope uh, anybody that has any questions, either uh, Dr. Darko has my information. Yep. Uh, and I'll be happy to help. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I will hang up with Dr. Walker and I will stay on just for a few more minutes um, just to kind of wrap things up with you guys. Take care, Dr. Walker. See you. All right, guys. So um, I really hope that this was helpful. I'm trying to. Let's see. Here we go. I really hope that this was helpful to you all. 
and um, that you got the information that you really needed. Um, again, this was the first time that we uh, talked to someone from an osteopathic school. My alma mater, um, Dr. Walker, has been um, really, really helpful uh, with, you know, with um, just kind of helping me uh, to do things with my own school, um, specifically around diversity. And I really look forward to working with him even more uh, in the future. But I want you to, if you haven't, you know, if you weren't here for the entire thing, I want you to go back and watch the replay. If you were here for the, for the entire thing, I want you to go back and watch the replay because there are so many nuggets of advice that he gives, some actionable steps that he gives that I think is going to be really important in all of you, in all of your pursuits to get into medical school. And remember, he, he kept saying, it is not just about the metrics. It's not just about the MCAT. It's not just about the, the GPA. There are a lot of things that your application to medical school says about you. It talks, it speaks to whether or not you're going to be a good doctor. Are you going to be a, a medical student who actually can, can get through? I mean, these are things that admissions committees really want to know. Um, and so I want you all to, if you, if you haven't, again, like I said, watch the entire thing, watch the entire thing, watch it again if you need to. But I think this was, I think a little bit different than the other, than the other interviews that we've had in the past, um, because of those kind of actionable steps, um, that were given. And I think that, um, you'll all be better for it. So. Until next time, okay, I will uh, try to bring you more and more and more um, with regards to steps, strategies, things that you can do in order to get into medical school. So to end this, I will say you know who I am. I am Dr. Renee Volney Darko, your go-to pre-med mentor, strategist, and coach. If, if you want to schedule a free strategy session with me and have a chance to be on my brand new podcast, which is going to be coming up in a couple of months. Why don't you go to www.premedstrategies.com and um, book a free strategy session with me. Okay. It's completely free. Um, you just go there and you click book a free strategy session. It is that easy. www.premedstrategies.com. Until next time. Peace.